Well, good evening, and thank you. It's a pleasure to join you this evening and celebrate uh, at MPEC's 14th Annual Convention. Salam and I go back a long way. Uh, I remember the Salam, that young Salam that we just saw in the video a few minutes ago. Um, as a state senator and a member of the House, I've worked with MPAC for many years now, uh, as well as the broader Muslim community here in Southern California, to improve relations between the faiths, to prom promote tolerance, understanding, and equality. That is a mission that you began before September 11th, and it is one that has taken on even greater significance in the years since. Even now, 13 years after the horrors of 9-11, American Muslims are still the victims of random violence and discrimination because of their faith. Last Sunday, a Seattle man beat a Somali-American cab driver while calling him a terrorist and asking him if he was a member of ISIS. Here in California, mosques in Santa Cruz and San Diego were vandalized in October and November, and a shooting took place at a mosque in Coachilla on November 4th. Thankfully, no one was injured. While these acts of violence may be directed at Muslims, they wound all of us, and each of us has a duty to respond, and forcefully. Like many in this room, I've repeatedly spoken out against hate and will continue to do so. Bigotry, in whatever form, has no place in our country. America deserves better. One of the distinguishing features of American experience has been the degree to which religious and ethnic communities have been integrated into our society and rejected the perverse lure of violence. This is due, I'm sure, to a number of factors, including the separation of church and state in America, our history of embracing religious pluralism, and the degree to which Americans have cherished an identity of being the great melting pot. And is also due to groups such as Impact, which have worked tirelessly to combat prejudice and prevent young people from drifting into dangerous radicalism. But America must not become complacent about the threats to its youth after more than a decade of war and given new and sophisticated propaganda campaigns by groups like ISIS. As some Americans lose touch with their communities and society, they have fallen prey to ISIS recruiters who have tried to lure them to Syria. This is what happened to three Colorado teenage girls earlier this fall who got as far as Frankfurt, Germany before they were intercepted and returned to their families. And this is where bigotry has the potential to harm all of us since prejudice can drive impressionable teens into the arms of jihadis. While a small number of Americans have joined ISIS, many hundreds of Europeans, French, British, and Russian among them have flocked to the Black Banner. As a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, I can tell you that what happens when they return to their home countries is the stuff of nightmares for Western security officials and European Muslim community leaders. None of us want that for our kids or for our country. That is why we must redouble our efforts to fight hatred here at home, even as we work hard with regional partners to defeat ISIS abroad. And if we're to confront hate, if we're to see the true spirit of all the great faiths like Islam, and if we're to forge a new community of all of God's children here and around the world, I can think of no better person to lead that effort than Rais Buyan. Rais was born in Bangladesh and moved to the United States after serving as a pilot in the Bangladeshi Air Force. Rais first moved to New York City and then to Dallas to seek career opportunities in computer technology. Just weeks after 9-11, while working as a clerk in a friend's gas station, Rais was shot in the face by a white supremacist named Mark Stroman, as we have just heard. Stroman called himself the Arab Slayer. Rais uh, thankfully survived the attack but lost the use of one eye and still carries dozens of shotgun pellets embedded in his face. Stroman confessed to shooting Buyan and killing two other South Asian workers and was sentenced to death. And here is where the story of Rais Buyan, a victim of a senseless and brutal crime, became a story of love triumphing over hate. Rais, as we have heard, mounted a nation nationwide effort to save Stroman and to have his sentence commuted to life in prison. Rice's pleas for mercy even reached the U.S. Supreme Court, but were ultimately unsuccessful, and Stroman was executed in 2011. In the hours before his execution, Rice spoke with Stroman, 
I forgive you, Rais said, and I do not hate you. Stroman responded, thank you from my heart. I love you, bro, you touched my heart. I would have never expected this. Rais replied, you touched mine too. In the years since Stroman's execution, Rais has continued with his World Without Hate campaign to promote healing, compassion, and forgiveness. Rais' inspiring story has not only been turned into the book by Anand, who has uh, shared his thoughts with us this evening, but is also being turned into a movie by Oscar-winning Catherine Bigelow. One year ago, the world lost the great Nelson Mandela, a man who, like Rais, was able to find forgiveness in his heart when almost any other person would have been consumed with bitterness and rage. But in his extraordinary life, Mandela learned an essential truth. No one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin or his background or his religion, he wrote in his autobiography. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. In the aftermath of the worst moment of his life, Rais learned that lesson of love, and he has dedicated his life to sharing it with us. It is humbling to stare the stage with him this evening. And his life reminds me of one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. It comes from Micah, and it says, what is required of us but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? I can't imagine anyone who more clearly embodies that ethic and that spirit than Rais Buyan. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Rais and to present him with the Muslim Public Affairs Foundation Human Relations Award to Rais Buyan in recognition of your commitment to the Islamic value of mercy, boundless compassion, and courage to speak truth over fear. Congratulations. I'm not that tall. I wish. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi Shrahali Sadri, who is a Amri, Wahadul Ugdatam, Milisani of Kahokali. Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Peace and blessings upon you. Well, um, it's such a great honor. For an ordinary person like me to be introduced to this beautiful crowd by, an hon by Honorable Congressman Adam Schiff. Congressman, thank you very much for your kind words about me, and thank you for your great introduction. And also, I would like to thank Anand for spreading the word of mercy and forgiveness throughout the world by his powerful writing. Anand, thank you very much. Well, uh, six years after electing a black president, race relations are at a new low in the United States. A few decades ago, a black man was lynched every other day. Today, a black man is killed every other day. But that doesn't mean the rest of the people in the US are living without any fear. The Latinos, Arabs, Asians, and whites, everyone living under the fear. Fear of unknown, fear of the other. And if we want, we can improve that. We can overcome the fear. 
blessed with enormous resources, we are the richest nation on earth, yet our inner cities are replete with thousands of homeless men, women, and children, many suffering mental health issues, hunger, ill health, and abject poverty. America can end, hun America can end homelessness and hunger, and America deserves better. So we are to investigate this idea today that America deserves better. Well, that seems fairly simple to me, but let's take it apart first. America, who is that? Can we at least agree that it is not anything exclusively? It is not white, brown, black, red, yellow, not male or female, not rich or poor, not police or criminal, not Muslim or Hindus or Christian or Jews or Buddhist or atheist or any other belief system, not Democrats or Republicans or independent, but all of these things, we, all of us, we are America. So we deserve better. Well, but better implies a comparison. To what? Then what? What is the not good enough that we have that we deserve to be better than? Well, for example, I look at Ferguson and at unrest in the New York City. I look at a challenged edu educational system that leaves some of its students entirely unequipped to participate in the American dream. I look at bitter partisan, bitter partisan US Congress. Who causes all of this? We, we do. But before we find out, uh, and then, uh, I, I, I ask myself, what is the common thing in all of this situation? And I think that the answer is blame. Because it is easy to point fingers instead of taking responsibilities. Well, I know something about blame. I personally know that. It was tempting not to blame all the whites in the USA because of the white supremacists who shot me in the face from four feet away and killed two other innocent Southeast, South Asian men and told the news media after he was arrested that what he did, most of Americans wanted to do but didn't have the courage. He claimed himself as a patriot and as a true American and he blamed me and my kind for 9-11. And I know that um, it was until I stopped blaming him and un until I saw that he too was a victim like me and that he never had received the education that might have allowed him to see me instead of my brown skin and hear my words instead of my accent, but he never got the chance. When I allowed myself to see all that and saw him as a human being like myself and that he hurt too, I was able to forgive him and I was able to save, uh, run a campaign to save his life. And in that moment, I was able to, for I was able to close the most painful chapter in my life and why I said that was the most painful chapter in my life, you have heard something about, about that uh, from Congressman Adam Schiff's speech, but I'll go ahead and do it very briefly. That because of the shooting incident, I lost a vision in one eye. I had been a pilot in Bangladesh Air Force, and because of the shooting incident, I will never be able to fly. I lost a tooth, which was thankfully replaced. I lost home because I no longer could work and pay rent. I was kicked out. 
When my father heard that I was shot in the face, he suffered a stroke. My medical bills were piling up, 10,000, 20,000, 30, it went up to $60,000. And every week I was receiving letter from different, um, from hospitals, from paramedics, ambulance service, from doctors, and I didn't know what to do with that. So I, with a big hope, I reached out to Red Cross. But finally they told me that I qualified for only one week's worth of groceries. I still like Red Cross because what they do for humanity is all over the world. It's a great organization. Not only that, thank you. Not only that, I lost my security. I developed some sorts of fear in my mind that if I go outside, somebody will shoot me again. So I stayed home for several months instead of going outside. I was depressed. It was, a, it was one of the sad part in my life that few months I couldn't go outside. I received more than 38 pillars on my face and I'm still carrying more than 35 and those pellets dug themselves into my skull. So when I touch my face, I feel it's bumpy. And finally, because of this medical treatment, doctor advised me not to fly, so I was not able to go back home to marry my fiance who had been waiting for several years. At some point she, she thought I'll never be able to go back, so she moved on with her life, married somebody else. She is now raising a family with another man. And there are more, but I don't wanna tell all those to bore you. But when I stopped blaming, I began to understand and repair and to heal. And more profoundly and more remarkable is that when my attacker, Mark Struman, heard that his victims forgave him, he was reduced to tears and he also began to change. I would like to show you a very brief video of Mark Stroman during last year of his life after he had learned that a coalition of Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, atheists, and many people from different walks of life were fighting to save his life and that one of his victims was spearheading, was spearheading this effort. Let's uh, play the video, please. Mr. Reyes, thank you for your, your inspiring act of, of compassion towards me. You have forgiven me, you have forgiven the unforgivable, and uh, I have a lot of love and respect for you. For the Patels, the Hassans, thank you all for what you all have done. Uh, your, the question is, if I don't make it, what do I want you to carry on? Man, just if, what you're doing today is, is remarkable to, you know, to, to get out there and take center stage and try to get the world, put the world to rights. You know, that's, that's a remarkable thing you're doing. And just continue with the human rights movement because you are touching so many people. I've been getting so many, so many letters and messages from all over the world that you, Mr. Reyes, are inspiring them. And that right there strengthens me. So, dude, just rock on. Thank you for giving me. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, it moves me every time I, I see that video clip to know that how this man changed. Before he was executed, he thanked the entire Muslim community. He condemned his own acts of violence and called me brother in an eight seconds phone conversation. That is astounding. It moves me profoundly just to think about that that a man tried to kill me simply because the ways in which I was different from him learned to see the ways in which we were the same enough to call me brother. 
it's a shame uh, at his execution, he apologized for his violent acts and he called for an end of hatred saying, hate is going on everywhere, it has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. It's a shame that even though I and the other victim's family members forgave him and didn't want him to die in our name, but my state of Texas failed to show some mercy on him, failed to give him a chance to repair. It has been 13 years since he survived an action motivated by racial hatred. What has changed since then? Still, this mentality exists in many people in our nation to hurt others. How many years we need to go through this fear, ignorance, and mistrust? How many more American lives have to be affected before we say enough is enough? Well, it is, it is uh, it's a time America needs to understand, to repair, and to heal. America does deserve better. We deserve better treatment from ourselves. We deserve a country that stands on its own original creed that all men and women, of course, are equally created. We deserve to be cherished by our fellows in this great melting pot called America, and that requires that we cherish the same fellows, all of them, even the ones who have not yet learned to respect us. These are the ones needs most of our, these are the ones I think need most of our respect. It is very important that we do this very soon before our young people lose hope. I would like to share with you a letter from a 17-year-old high school student who was in an, in, a, at a, in an audience that I recently spoke to. And please excuse me that I'm reading some compliments to myself, but that is not why I shared this letter. I just that I think this letter should be read in its entirety. And at the end, you will see why this letter concerns me. She says, Dear Mr. Vuyan, thank you so much for coming to speak to my class the other day. I will go ahead and say the obvious. Your words, your story is inspirational and unbelievable. Living with Arab nationality today, as I do, is scary. The stereotypes that line the eyes of the people around you are scary. The clips you see on the news of your country are scary. But your words are powerful and your actions are strong enough to break through many American walls. Within the weeks before you came to my class, my pride in America had been wavering. I was blinded by the images of air strikes we had sent killing thousands the threats we were receiving, the complete chaos of Ferguson, Missouri. I saw the homeless on the street and heard the judgment, the judgment of everything, living privileged mouths. I felt the blindness to those around me, taking for granted the gifts we have, we have been given and how greedy it seemed all of America had become, including myself. As you shared your story that day, I became angrier. All I could hear was the negative in your story, how unfairly life had treated you. I was blinded until someone asked you if you still thought America was the land of opportunity. The American dream you see to me had become a historical phrase, something not still possible. Your answer, yes, shocked me. 
not only did I sh not only did not only did it shock me, but it pulled my blinders away. I am able to see that again, that despite our major flaws, we are still a great country. And for that, I thank you. This young girl needed to hear that that blame is not productive, that mercy, forgiveness is possible, and that, yes, there is life. There is vitality after failure. We will fail, we will fall, all of us, but we must forgive ourselves and one another. If we expect perfection, we will be eternally disappointed if instead we teach our young people that imperfection is part of human condition and that tolerance and forgiveness are required of all and for all, then we still have a chance. They will still be able to believe in this great country. It is essential, it is very important that they do. And that's why I tell my story. And that's why we all must tell our stories because our children need to hear them. America deserves better. Let that begin with us. May we all work together toward giving America what it deserves. And may that come back to us as a karma. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Mr. Honor to meet you in person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Raiz Buyan. Compelling story, a compelling story told in a compelling book that is available on your way out. You can pick up a copy, meet the author, meet Rice, get it signed, and convey this story, which reflects our faith as an integral part of the American narrative. Convey that to your friends, to your neighbors, to your colleagues. This is what you can take away with from tonight. I wanted to thank once again our recipient, Rais Boyan. It was my honor to meet you and to hear your story, Congressman Adam Schiff, and Anan, the author of The True American. <laughs> <laughs>